Winter 1944 had carved deep snow into the Dolomites' limestone faces near the Paso della Mendola. Three German combat engineers huddled in a reinforced observation post at 7,200 feet, their Zeiss binoculars frosting in the pre-dawn cold. Hauptmann Klaus Weber, a veteran of the Eastern Front, studied the switchback trail below with growing disbelief. What he saw defied every engineering manual the Wehrmacht possessed. Fifteen American GMC trucks, each overloaded with artillery shells, were ascending a rock face his team had surveyed three weeks earlier and abandoned as mathematically impossible. The gradient measured 42 degrees, where their instruments had predicted catastrophic failure for any vehicle over eight tons. The lead truck, painted in olive drab and dented from a thousand miles of war, crawled upward with inexorable patience. Its six wheels chewed into scree that German half-tracks had slipped on weeks before, sending rocks tumbling into the abyss. Weber lowered his binoculars and whispered words that would reach Kesselring's headquarters by nightfall. They've built machines that ignore the laws of physics and the logic of war. This wasn't merely a supply convoy. It was industrial superiority in violent motion. Every meter those trucks gained proved that an entire economic system had arrived at the Alpine front, one that measured success not by elegant design, but by relentless function. The German defensive strategy, which relied on terrain as an unbreakable ally, was being disproven one gearbox at a time. Before we dissect how American trucks became the ghosts inside Germany's war machine, take a moment to subscribe and enable notifications for this channel. We excavate the forgotten engineering stories that actually decided World War II, not just the battles you've heard of a hundred times. If understanding how logistics defeats strategy appeals to you, then this community is exactly where you belong. The Italian campaign of 1943-1945 presented the most brutal mountain warfare in modern history. The Winter Line, Monte Cassino, and the Apennine Spine reduced Allied air superiority to a spectator sport and turned tank advantages into liabilities. German Field Marshal Albert Kesselring understood that terrain could multiply his depleted forces turning each peak into a fortress and every valley into a killing field. But terrain cuts both ways, and Kesselring's greatest vulnerability lay in the thousand winding supply routes his troops needed to hold those heights. A Tiger tank positioned perfectly on a ridge was worthless without diesel, just as an MG-42 nest was silent without ammunition crates. The crucial bottleneck wasn't firepower or fortitude. It was the mundane, impossible task of moving tonnage across geography that hated wheels. German engineering had built its reputation on precision, over-engineering, and an obsession with quality that approached art. Their solution to mountain logistics involved complex half-tracks, like the CD KKAU FZ 251, elaborate cable car systems and the same mule trains Napoleon had used. This approach revealed a critical flaw by 1944. They built for perfection, not production, and the raw materials for perfection had run out. Chromium for hardened steel grew so scarce that axle shafts began failing on 15-degree slopes, while synthetic rubber substitutes turned tires into brittle hoops that shattered in cold weather. Each half-track required specialized mechanics and factory parts that took weeks to arrive, assuming the factories hadn't been bombed. The German engineering mind couldn't conceive of a solution built from abundance because abundance had become a foreign concept. American industrial philosophy approached the problem with arrogant simplicity. The good enough principle prioritized mass production, standardization, and reliability over elegant design. Their hero vehicle, the GMC CCKW 2.5-ton truck, better known as the Deuce and a Half, rolled off assembly lines at a rate that defied comprehension. 
812,000 CCKWs were built between 1941 and 1945, a number exceeding Germany's entire military truck production across all categories. Each truck cost $8,500, less than a single month's maintenance for a Panther tank. They weren't designed to win engineering awards. They were designed to move five tons across a continent that had burned its own infrastructure. The specifications sheet told a story of compromise and purpose. A 270 cubic inch inline six engine produced only 104 horsepower, but could digest the lowest grade 68 octane fuel, even captured German B4 petrol that knocked in their own engines. The frame accepted abuse that would crack a half tracks torsion bar suspension, while the six wheel drive system mocked gradients with the impatience of a tool built by men who had never heard the word impossible. What truly shocked those German engineers wasn't a truck, but a manifestation of an economic system they could no longer comprehend. It climbed terrain their own textbooks had dismissed as mathematically impossible because it was designed for a different kind of war, a war where you built a million units and let the drivers figure out the rest. This was the moment when logistics became strategy, and strategy became surrender. The Paso della Mendola sits at 4,737 feet in the Trentino region, where the southern limestone Alps collapse into the Po Valley. In November 1944, the 5th Army's 10th Mountain Division needed 75 tons of 105 mm artillery shells delivered to Riva del Garda within 48 hours to support a breakthrough assault. German engineers had spent three weeks blasting a primitive road into the North Face, only to abandon it after their instruments measured a 42-degree maximum grade that their own eight-ton half-tracks couldn't negotiate. The roadbed consisted of loose scree over shattered limestone, a surface that shifted under weight like ball bearings on a slope. German calculations factored in their vehicles' power-to-weight ratios, ground pressure of 13 pounds per square inch, and the coefficient of friction for steel tracks on loose rock. Their conclusion was mathematically sound and militarily fatal. The route was impassable for mechanized transport, and final supply would require mule teams taking three days per trip. Lieutenant Colonel James R. Tall, quartermaster for the 10th Mountain, received the order at 300 hours on November 18th, he had 15 GMC CCKWs available, each officially rated for 2.5 tons, but already proven capable of carrying double that on the flat runs from Naples. Tall's drivers were veterans of the Red Ball Express, 80% African-American men, who had learned to coax impossible performance from overloaded machines across France's ruined roads. The convoy rolled out at dawn with each truck carrying 5.2 tons of artillery shells, bringing individual vehicle weight to 2,400 pounds, nearly double the German safety limit. Mechanics had welded auxiliary winches to front bumpers and fitted double tow chains rated for 20 tons, while drivers aired down their giant 10.5 gigs 20 tires to 15 psi to increase contact patches on the loose surface. Quartermaster Corps men also distributed 60 extra wheel chocks per truck, expecting the need to secure vehicles during the seven-hour climb. The technique the drivers employed looked crude, but exploited physics that German engineering had dismissed as inefficient. They used a rocking method, simultaneously working clutch and throttle to create micro-movements that prevented wheel spin on the scree, essentially letting the tires bite and release until they found purchase. When a truck stalled, the winch line would be secured to a rock anchor uphill, and the vehicle would literally pull itself forward while the rear wheels pushed, distributing torque across all six contact points. By noon, the lead truck had crested the pass, its engine temperature needle buried in the red but holding steady. One by one, all 15 trucks reached the summit, their cargo intact, and their frames groaning but intact. German observers in the valley below, 
who had expected to watch a mechanical slaughter, instead saw a demonstration of applied mass production that violated every principle in their engineering manuals. The convoy delivered the shells with three hours to spare, enabling the 10th Mountain Division's artillery to hammer German positions at Monte Belvedere for 36 continuous hours. The breakthrough cracked Kesselring's defensive line and opened the path to the Po Valley three days ahead of schedule. What the German engineers had witnessed was not luck or weather conditions. It was a system designed to make its own luck through redundancy and mass. The GMC CCKW's engine was a masterpiece of anti-engineering designed for anything except elegance. Its 270 cubic inch inline six cast iron block required no chromium for hardening and no nickel for heat resistance. Materials America prioritized for aircraft engines and battleship armor. The engine's 104 horsepower seemed puny compared to German diesels, but it produced maximum torque at 1,600 RPM, exactly where truck drivers needed it for climbing. This power plant could run on 68 octane gasoline so crude it qualified as industrial solvent, a crucial advantage when Germany's synthetic fuel factories were priority bombing targets. The fuel system lacked fine filtration by German standards, but this meant clogged filters could be removed and the engine would still function on unfiltered fuel in emergencies. Mechanics could completely rebuild an engine in a field workshop using hand tools and parts that cost less than a German officer's sidearm. The drivetrain employed Timken split axles and a locking differential system that redirected all power to any wheel with traction through a simple mechanical lever. When engaged, the system forced all six wheels to turn at identical speeds, regardless of individual grip, essentially treating the truck as a tracked vehicle with six contact points instead of two long belts. On paper, this design wasted fuel and increased tire wear, but in practice, it allowed the CCKW to climb grades of 60% on firm ground and 40% on loose scree. Figures German engineers dismissed as propaganda until they saw the proof. The tires represented another quiet revolution in materials science that bypassed Germany's critical rubber shortages. Goodyear's combat tires used butyl synthetic rubber that performed better at low temperatures than natural rubber. With 12 ply construction that could withstand 50 caliber bullet strikes without immediate deflation. Even when punctured, the self sealing compound closed around small holes, and the tire's carcass remained intact enough to support the truck at 10 miles per hour for 50 miles, enough to escape an ambush or complete a delivery. Production genius lay not in any single component, but in how 300 subcontractors fed standardized parts to assembly lines that completed one truck every 12 minutes. The manufacturing process used 20,000 fewer man-hours than German half-track construction, with a unit cost of $8,500 compared to the STI KFZ, 251's $50,000 price tag. American factories employed women, elderly men, and disabled workers who needed only three weeks of training to perform their specialized tasks, while German plants required master craftsmen who were increasingly conscripted into infantry units. German half-tracks like the Steed High KVFZ. 251 represented the pinnacle of sophisticated military vehicle design, but also the nadir of practical wartime production. Their torsion bar suspension system provided a ride so smooth that soldiers could fire accurately from the moving vehicle, yet repairing a broken bar required a hydraulic press and specialized jigs that existed only at depots behind the front lines. By 1944, steel quality had degraded so severely due to chromium shortages that frame members cracked on routine 15-degree slopes, something the designers had never anticipated because their specifications assumed pre-war materials would remain available forever. The German rubber crisis forced engineers to retrofit steel wheels on some supply trucks, which performed adequately on paved roads, but sank into mud or shatter on rocky terrain. 
synthetic rubber substitutes made from coal tar derivatives became brittle below freezing, causing tire failures that stranded hundreds of vehicles during the 1944-45 winter in Italy. Even when tires held together, low-octane B4 fuel caused destructive engine knock that reduced power output by 30% at high altitudes where oxygen was already scarce. Bearing failures became epidemic when tin shortages eliminated the Babbitt metal used in engine main bearings, forcing substitution with inferior alloys that wore out in 500 miles instead of 5,000. Each failure required an engine rebuild with tools and skills most field mechanics lacked, creating a cascading maintenance nightmare. German quartermasters reported that by early 1945, 40% of their vehicles were immobilized, not by combat damage, but by unavailability of replacement bearings. The production philosophy gap yawned wider than any technological difference. German manufacturers built over 600 variants of military vehicles, each optimized for specific roles, but creating a logistical nightmare for parts supply. American factories produced exactly three major truck types, with parts interchangeability exceeding 90% between models, meaning a broken-down deuce and a half could be cannibalized to repair three others. German factories employed slave labor whose sabotage rate reached 15 to 20 percent by late war, while American plants had production incentive bonuses and quality control that caught defects before they reached the field. When Hauptmann Weber's report reached Kesselring's headquarters, it triggered a crisis of confidence among staff officers who still believed in German technical superiority. His final assessment read, American trucks are not vehicles in the traditional sense. They are mobile platforms that treat terrain as a suggestion rather than a limitation. He detailed how their weight distribution techniques, which German engineers dismissed as brute force, actually redistributed load dynamically across all six wheels as the truck moved, something static calculations couldn't model. Weber also noted that while German differentials required 30 minutes of mechanical adjustment with specialized tools, American drivers could lock theirs with a simple lever pull from the cab. This meant that when a truck lost traction, the solution was instantaneous rather than requiring a maintenance halt under enemy observation. The practical result was that American convoys kept moving through conditions that would have fragmented German columns into individual breakdowns, each waiting for mechanics who might never arrive. The drivers who executed this climb were mostly veterans of the Red Ball Express, the massive supply operation that had kept Patton's Third Army moving across France. 75% of those drivers were African American, men who had faced discrimination at home but had become the most experienced truck operators in the world by late 1944. They had learned techniques on the ruins of French roads that no engineering school could teach developing an intuitive understanding of how to coax impossible performance from overloaded machines. The rocking technique they used on the Paso della Mendola came from experience in the Loire Valley mud, where convoys had to cross fields that had become swamps after Allied bombing destroyed drainage systems. Drivers learned to feel the exact moment when tires began to spin and would instantly modulate throttle and clutch to create a seesaw motion, letting the truck's weight shift forward and backward until the tires bit into solid ground. This dance between human and machine transformed the truck from a static collection of specifications into a dynamic system that responded to terrain the way a sailor 